Hi, this is Gorbag here at Gorbag TV, G-O-R-E-B-A-G-G -G TV, and I wanted to just introduce you to the tenor, what I call Zen flute, some people call it a recorder, and I'll be also playing uh, in the next mm, few hundred uh, sessions uh, Native American flutes, which are similar to this. I play this flute, it is what I call a Zen flute, which is in the Zen manner, although it is a recorder. And I will give you some idea of what it sounds like when I do thusly. Those are some uh, demonstrations of two various techniques that combined can make a very interesting flute experience, <clears throat> which is what I would call shamanic flute, which is a combination of spirit flute and zen flute, let's call it. So there's some, definitely some Japanese influences here, but those influences also are going to be Brazilian, Jamaican, Haitian and possibly uh, African, uh, West African, Central African, Eastern African, Southern African, South African, uh, possibly also um, 
uh, Arabic, Egyptian, uh, Libyan, Sy uh, Syrian, uh, Lebanese, uh, Israeli, because everybody makes flutes. They all make flutes, Chinese, Korean, Japanese, they all, everybody makes flutes. So, uh, as, soon as, you can, as soon as you discover it, you blow through this thing, hey look, there's a hole in this when I go like that. Whoa, I just made the two-hole flute. Then somebody goes, well, I just made the three-hole flute. Oh yeah, I made the many, many, many hole flute. And so forth. And they'll make flutes as long as the arm can reach. It's true. Um, in fact, there's some flutes and contra uh, flutes that are so large that you actually can't operate them as an individual. One, one person can't operate the thing, the contras, contra bass. So, let's look at, this is pretty long, this is a tenor, which is a pretty long instrument, and a pretty deep instrument, and not an instrument to be attempted by a beginner, recorder, player, flute player, whatever. You don't want to start out on the tenor. That's deadly, because you're going to get very disappointed You'll be making squeaks all day long. So you, what you want to do is learn breath control. You do that by using an alto flute, uh, not a tenor. Um, you want to learn uh, fingering, and you learn that on the soprano because it's the easiest to play, <laughs> hands down the easiest to play. I'll be demonstrating all of those tonight. <clears throat> so sit back, relax, everybody, and. Um, I'm going to just uh, demonstrate some of the techniques that can be used in a recorder. Now, first of all, play the recorder in sort of the style that it was intended to be played in. By intended, I mean by the makers of the uh, this tenor recorder. Oh, by the way, this is um, uh, Molenauer, and I am uh, I because of my students, I made myself a dealer. I actually got a dealership in Molenauer flute uh, uh, recorders. So if you want one of these, these are fabulous, this thing. This is a beautiful Brazilian rosewood. And uh, I have rosewood, I have every kind of, of wood imaginable. And uh, I can also order a custom made for you if you want something custom tuned. Like maybe you don't want an A440. Maybe you want something like a medieval renaissance tuning. That can be arranged easy to get. And um, I can give you my recommendations on which one you should have, you personally should have, to start with and then to go to and then to go to again the third time. You want basically three recorders. You want a recorder that's a soprano, you want an alto, and you want a tenor. You certainly don't want to start off with a tenor, as I said. So let's go into the sounds of the tenor. First of all, one of the things that's the most challenging of all is to get that low note first off. It's very hard. It's really hard. So what you want to do is set your set your keys down. You see, I have two gold. These are gold plated. They gold plated. I guess they're brass keys. And you want to get this set up so that you really have no trouble at all holding down this and, and hitting those. It's really hard, like I said. So, you want to get that exactly right, if you can. You'll feel it. It'll be right. So, from here. All the breath control in the world is going to be needed to get that low note. And what I recommend you do is stay away from it and take the next lowest. See? And start there. Just leave your leave your, your pinky out of this for the moment when you're starting out with the tether. I've lifted one finger. Okay, so I have my I have, uh, I have nine little piggies all on the flute, and uh, no, I have eight. And two, my pinkies are both up in the air, like I'm having 
tea with the with the vicar. Okay? In the Victorian tea. Like this. Now, what I'm gonna to try to do is get that next lowest note. Actually it's just two notes low. There's a Said it's very hard to get those low notes, and at this point you should don't don't even try because you will eventually get it. And as the as your recorder, your flute, your Zen flute, your your um, Native American flute, whatever it is, if it's wood, it's going to warm up and it's going to do several things. Uh, people think that there's spit inside there. There isn't. It's it's condensation because you have hot breath going into this thing and condensing. So. You have to manage the condensation in this, otherwise your recorder will swell up and not play anymore. Uh, and be, uh, you can't even we'll take it apart and be able to play it, it'll be useless. So you have to be very, very aware of the buildup of moisture inside your recorder. It's especially true in the mouthpiece area. Ooh, uh, you're gonna lose, if, if you have a very fine recorder, you're gonna lose big bucks if you're not careful. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to cover the thumb on the bottom hole here and then we're going to cover the first, second, third, see, like that. And I can hold that with one hand like this by putting, by swinging my pinky underneath, see, so I have my thumb under here over one hole. My pinky here, there is no hole down below that on the bottom, but on the top there is. Now this is kind of heavy. So I want to kind of get over to here so I can hold it with the other thumb. So I have one thumb holding it here, but it's over a hole. And I have another thumb holding it here, and it's not over a hole. Now my pinky is up because I have this under here to support it. So that's one, two, three, four, five. And then there's a double hole down here. It's a little double hole here. And then there's the brass fittings. What you're going to do is hit that double hole and leave the fittings alone. And you're going to try to get a sound out of this that isn't a squeak. Here's some squeaks. Oh, I almost made it there, sorry. That's all from overblowing. Uh, you've got to hit the exact right temperature of, of breath going out. That comes from thousands of hours of experience knowing exactly how much breath to put into that note. Because up one from that, you have to actually make your, your, your breath gentler because it's easier to blow that note. And then the next up from that, you have to ease off your breath even more. Why? Because you want to even out, at first, you want to even out all the notes, you want to even out the music and get it so that you have a, a very balanced tone. It's not like when you hit this note it's loud, when you hit that note it's always soft. You want to get them all about the same at first. Then you want to start intonation. That's later on. You're going to start intonation when you start getting notes more expressively. I mean, you're going to hit the note, but it'll be louder, it'll have a quaver, it will have a tweak or a twitch in it, or whatever it might be. Uh, so, with the tremolos and quavers and that kind of thing, and, and squeaks and, 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 and squelches and, and, and lifts and all that sort of thing. So you have lots and lots of opportunity to change the note in terms of its temperament, not its pitch. And then you can also change its pitch by riding on the air columns that are coming out, they're emerging from these holes, because there's air coming out of there, as well as out of the, the bottom of it. Matter of fact, if it wasn't coming out of here, and here, and here, you wouldn't get those sounds, those, those kinds of ghostly, eerie sounds out of there. Now listen carefully. I, uh, I 
hit one of the lower notes. I shouldn't have done that for you because you, I don't want to encourage you to do that this time. So uh, what you're going to do it for the first lesson is just try to hit that kind of low note. Remember, it's not a full low note. It's, it's, um, it's the sort of low note. You're still in the wood, see? You're still on the wood. You're not touching brass. Now you're going to blow this note, and you're going to listen to yourself blowing it. You're going to hear variations as you blow. Listen carefully. I'm deliberately exaggerating, but you're going to hear variations. And those variations are going to come from issues with breath control, primarily. So your very first task, and it's going to be for the first week, I would imagine, is to just get a good tone and a good steady tone out of that particular note. So that's the note you want to hit right there. Which note is that? It doesn't matter. I don't want you to learn this stuff by rote. So the note you're hitting, you have both pinkies in the air, riding up in the air. Keep them up there because you're going to use those later. And your all other fingers and thumbs are occupied. See? There's the thumb there on the, over the hole on the left, and there's a thumb on the, on the uh, uh, unholed wood on the right. You're going to have your left hand like this. Again, once more, just to review it. Your thumb goes on the bottom hole, right underneath the mouthpiece. There's a bottom hole that goes there. Then your first finger, your go forefinger goes on the first hole, your middle finger goes in the second hole, your ring finger goes in the third hole, and keep your pinky up. Then put your right thumb, and I don't care if you're left-handed or right-handed, this is how you're going to do it. Your right thumb goes underneath, your right finger, your forefinger, rather, goes on the fourth hole, your middle finger goes on the fifth hole, and your ring finger goes on the sixth hole, which has two holes on it. If it doesn't have two holes, you're not playing the right instrument. And you're now going to put the mouthpiece up, and you're going to just rest it like this, and you'll notice that your, your chin and your lip kind of naturally go into this enormous mouthpiece. You don't want to wrap your lips around the mouthpiece, not now, not ever. You're just going to blow into it. Just put your lips against the mouthpiece and blow into it. And kind of rest it against your lip. It's all right to do that. So you'll hear a little bit of a squeaky high. And the reason for that will be that you're going to have a dry instrument and a, and a cool instrument in your hand. So don't forget, look at my... Uh, uh, my uh, le lessons on uh, how to warm up your Zen flute, that's important. Okay. And yes, try to blow it as long as you can. Take a nice breath, but don't take an overly ridiculously long, <laughs> deep breath like that. Just take a nice breath in and blow out gently for as long as you can. Until you, you know, don't do it uncomfortably. Do it so it's normal and natural for you. Now, when you do that, that's kind of a controlled breathing out exercise in itself. And so it will actually naturally teach you breath control and breathing techniques that I would not dare to show you without this to moderate your, your breathing. Um, this instrument is a safety tool that will, hopefully will ensure
sure that you play, if you play it normally, uh, you will not um, uh, do wild things with your lungs, hopefully. If you play it normally, you shouldn't. Now, um, suppose that we have that note or that particular thing mastered. So now what we do, and I know this is unutterably boring to you because you want to play the instrument, you just want to play, play, you know, Christmas music, I understand. Or get out there in the woods with a flip camera, with birds flying all around and you're going to do this wonderful uh, thing. But you really need to actually learn how to get the tones out. So let me show you the next step that you really should take. <clears throat> so the next step is going to be to get variations in that tone. Again, take a comfortably large, but not overly large, breath in. And you're going to exhale rather slowly. And you're going to try to listen to the different things that happen to this note when you vary the breathing. I should mention one thing to you in terms of efficiency. You know, when you breathe in, most people do not know how to breathe. They haven't got a clue. They, th they say, you don't know how to breathe. I don't. I breathe every day. Yeah, you breathe, but you don't breathe right. So if you're breathing out into this instrument and you want to be efficient and effective with your breath and you only have, the, you, see, you, have you have one breath for one out breath, you know what I'm saying? You don't have a second chance of that out-breath, not that out-breath, you know. Next one you do, but not that one. So you have an out-breath. Now, that out-breath would be significantly shortened in duration. I wouldn't be able to do that for as long if I unconsciously was at the same time letting air go out through my nose. Do you understand? So it's like swimming. You don't have to hold, you know, if you, know, if you need one of the, if you're a swimmer who needs a nose clip, this is not for you. So you don't want to be breathing out through your nose while you're breathing out through your mouth, unless you want to do it as an effect. But otherwise, it's not the, not a good thing to do. It's not efficient. Watch. That's all I get. And that's what most people complain of. Oh, I can't blow it as long as you can. No, because you're blowing all your breath out through your nose, you idiot. So don't do that. Blow it out a lot. Blow it out through your mouth. Is I guess the way they would say it. Cotter, uh, welcome back, Cotter. Right. Blow it out through your mouth. <laughs> Up your nose with a rubber hose. You don't know that's, uh, that's, that's from the 1860s. That's the 1860s television. 1740s television. 1980s, I don't know. So, um, let's go to the next step, which is to find out uh, how we can make things happen in just one note. So we're going to play a one note uh, serenade. It's one note, but it isn't one thing. It's one note. You understand what I'm saying? A note isn't just a note. There are colorations. There are textures. There are intonations. There are all kinds of things, inflectures, inflectures, that go into a note, that a note can become. So the modulation of it. Let me put it this way. A note is like a carrier wave for an AM transmission, radio transmission. By the way, almost anything can create radio waves, and but some of them are stronger than others. So something creates a radio wave. The radio wave emanates, theoretically, that's not actually, but it actually, it uh, travels along an already established route or an already established path like a neural path, and 
um, and it explodes in various stages along there because it has disruption and, uh, and phase adjustments that it makes as it travels. So, um, radio waves are traveling anyway. It's like, a, like there's a train and that's going to go from point A to point B. It's going to go from, uh, let's say, from 14th Street to 123rd Street. Anyhow, so you want to get uh, something to 123rd Street. So you load the train up with whatever you want to get to 123rd Street. And the train will carry you there. That's what you do with the radio wave. You load a radio wave up with information that expresses itself as music, news, and weather. So here you have a pressure wave that you set up going out toward your audience and toward yourself. That pressure wave can be modulated. Basically, it's, uh, it's massaged and the massaging of it creates different sounds. So let's be really obvious about this massage and take one single note and make those massagings with one single note. And I'll do that right now. educate me. Thank you. Um, what I mean is, of course, finger position. I don't really mean a note because you can make lots of notes in one finger position. This is a finger position here. See, you can do all those variations in one finger position. Technically, it's, a, it's not a note, actually. It's a finger position. Now I'm going to lift one finger. I'm going to lift one finger of my right hand, so I'll have two fingers in the air on my right hand. Get it? My ring finger and my pinky are in the air, exposing that double hole in the wood and these two little brassy guys, which we're not going to deal with right this second. So I've got one, two fingers up in the air now. My thumb is still holding on for dear life so I can keep this very heavy thing balanced and, and in, in the uh, right position. Do all your tricks with it. Find out what it does. That's that one note. Now you're going to lift not one, but two fingers. So you're going to lift up your two fingers, the next two fingers, not one, two. Two fingers. So you now have four fingers in the air and one thumb supporting your tenor flute. Now let's go and see what that does. Raise another one in my left hand now. Now I'm going to sneak my finger down, my, my right forefinger down on the flute so I can lift my middle finger on my left hand. So I've only got my thumb and forefinger on. I could hold it with just the thumb, but I like to put my finger here. Now, don't put your finger over a hole because it will obviously affect it. Now you're going to lift both. You're going to slip your finger, you're going to slip your fingers under here, your ring and pinky under there, and you're not going to cover any holes, and you're going to lift both, and you're going to rest them in your mouth. Like that. So, that's a fingering. It's not a particularly good fingering, but it's a really good one for a beginner. And you don't need to use that high note at all if you don't want to. So just leave your fingers alone up there and only go from here. talk about that later.
later, you can actually make half notes and quarter notes and all kinds of things with this. Mm -hmm. By just sliding your fingers, open hole, so you can slide your finger along, and that is actually part of another technique that I'll show you with the, you can learn this with the forefinger of the right hand. You do all the covers with your left, as normal. You take your right hand, put your thumb underneath, and just you're just going to roll your forefinger around on that hole, which is the fourth hole down. Not counting the back, it's the fourth hole. One, two, three, the fourth hole, your right forefinger is over. It's going to roll over the thing, so... The harder you blow, different effect. Softer you blow, have a different effect. If you blow um, sideways or kind of cockeyed, uh, you'll have a different effect. And if you uh, close the hole slowly or fast, you'll have different effects. There's other things that will happen with that. Now you can use a flutter as well. And I'll teach you the flutter, first of all, with one finger. So that we're going to use that same thing. We're going to have left like this. Your left is covered like that, first, second, third. Your thumb is underneath covering your bottom hole. You're going to put your th right thumb underneath. Your right forefinger is going to be operating the hole on the top, which is the fourth hole. And you're going to flutter it up and down. You can actually hear it without me blowing. Now watch. Like that. Now you do it faster, slower, really slow, really, really fast, like that. And then of course if you overblow, like that. Overblowing means you're going to just puff into it momentarily to make that squeaky sound. And you can use that for your eagle calls and hawk calls as well, which I'll show you on the Native American flute specifically. Um, they will uh, demonstrate easily for you how you can use those, uh, those sounds. You can get all kinds of animal sounds out of the flute, and we're going to discuss all that as we go through the course. So this is the tenor flute. That's the basics of the tenor flute. We will talk an awful lot more about the nuances. There's thousands of things you can do with this. It's not as simple as it looks. It is a simple looking instrument, but it's not. It's a very complex instrument that has an awful lot of, of a potential that most people never realize, simply because they think it is just a recorder. It is more than that. Any flute in the right hands can sound like absolutely anything you want it to sound like. And the reason you would choose one, is because this flute over that flute, is because this flute feels more comfortable to you, you bond with it more easily, it's a flute that you like to play, it's a flute that feels good to you to play, and it's a flute that does the things, makes the sounds that you want to make. Now, if you don't know any of those things, if you don't know what you want, you'll end up with a piece of plastic. And you should, at the very first, buy some plastic, Yamaha plastic flute, enjoy yourself, see if you like it, don't get into the flute for $2,000, $3,000, even $1,000 for a cheap wooden flute, hardwood flute. Um, if, you're not, if it's just going to sit in your closet uh, you know, and, and, uh, and, and gather dust, don't do it. Don't bother. This is a very difficult instrument, the tenor in particular, the tenor recorder. It's very difficult. And uh, it has complexities and it has uh, breathing difficulties, it has reach difficulties for people. Many people can't make those reaches. Uh, I can barely make the reach to get the low notes. And I, I do pretty well with the saxophone. This is a very, very challenging instrument. And uh, the lower the instrument is that you're trying to blow into, the harder it is to get those sounds. Uh, there's a lot more demand. So the lower and lower and lower you, you blow this thing, the lower the, the, the pitch, the more demand is going to be made, the more breath you need, first of all, to play with, because it's a bigger hole and it's more air to move. So you have to have a lot of lung capacity to handle the tenor.
tell you that. All right, so uh, we're going to do a little bit of just straight playing, tenor playing, in a little while. But uh, in the meantime, uh, let's just all take a break and uh, get some coffee and donuts, and we'll be right back. <laughs>